Welcome to all of you. I'm going to wait one more minute as our attendees are joining the webinar and then we'll begin. Again, welcome. I'm just waiting a few more minutes to allow everyone to enter the webinar. Um, we want to make sure our speaker has entered and is ready. And then I'll begin with an introduction. Glad you could be here tonight. Hello, I'd like to welcome all of you to our special event in honor of National Voter Registration Day. My name is Karen Robinson. I am an associate professor of political science here at Hood College in Frederick, Maryland. My co-host tonight is Tamlin Tucker Wargs. She is also from the political science department and together with the departments of history, law and criminal justice, and the Women and Gender Studies program, um, we'd like to welcome you. We'd also like to give an especial thank you to the offices of the President and the Provost for their support of this webinar. Tonight, we gather to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. At this moment in history, we find ourselves in the midst of numerous crises, a pandemic, racial unrest, and now a nation mourning Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The right to vote and the responsibility to vote is critical. Our speaker tonight will speak of the persistency and commitment of early suffragists that is sure to inspire us today. At the conclusion of her remarks, though, there will be time for you to ask questions and also I'll provide instructions on how to do that at the conclusion of her talk. And now I'm happy to introduce you to our speaker. Dr. Joanna Newman is one of the nation's leading experts on the history of women's suffrage. An award-winning historian and a scholar in residence at American University, she's written two books on the topic, Gilded Suffragists, The New York Socialites Who Fought for Women's Right to Vote, and, and Yet They Persisted, How American Women Won the Right to Vote. Dr. Newman earned a PhD in history from American University in 2016. Prior to her time in academia, Dr. Newman was a journalist and covered the White House, State Department, and Congress for USA Today and the Los Angeles Times. She currently resides in Florida where she joins us from now. And so I welcome you, Dr. Joanna Newman. Well, hello, I, I don't know if you can hear me. I know you can't see me. Dr. Newman, you, you should be able to, I'm sorry, this is Tamil and Tucker Words. You should be able to start your video. There you are. Let me see you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction and for the incredible um, generosity of the university and hosting me this evening. Um, as we've been talking, the, this is the 100th anniversary, 100 years ago this year, women won the right to vote, or another way to put it is that all the gender barriers uh, were removed from women voting uh, in the 19th Amendment. I've heard some women say that um, the event is not as magical as it could have been if we had already broken the highest glass ceiling in the land and won the presidency. Um, I've also heard some men, and I trust they were kidding, 
um, say that the um, that the you know the whole world um, went to ruin after women had the vote. I think both of these sort of dark um, visions are not both dark, but both of these miss the magic of this moment, and that's what I want to share with you tonight. Don't let anyone tell you that this was some quaint achievement by a group of, um, you know, cutely decorated ladies marching in the streets uh, with um, cute little signs asking for the right to vote. This was a serious, difficult campaign um, spread over several centuries by many, eight generations of women. Um, the reason I say it's a singular achievement is that there, when the Constitution was written in 1787, the 55 men who met in Philadelphia that summer made several decisions. One you may be familiar with is to, to cede um, most um, election issues to the states. But the other was to make it very, very difficult to amend this constitution. The Congressional uh, Historian's Office says that in the 233 years since the constitution was passed, about 12,000 constitutional amendments have been suggested. Most of them, I assume, just you know, go to a committee where they languish forever. 33 of them were sent to the states. And keep in mind that these, these founders, the writers of the Constitution, put the bar very high for amending the Constitution. You have to have two thirds of a vote from the House and the Senate, and then you need to clear three fourths of the states for ratification. So in the 233 years since there have only been 33 amendments sent to the states for ratification. Now, the first 10 were what we know as the Bill of Rights. And that was pretty much assured passage because it was the price that many states put on their willingness to ratify the Constitution. So if you take away those 10, you're now talking about 17 amendments. Two of them were first the enactment and then the repeal of prohibition. So 15 amendments since this country's founding have stayed on the books. And one of them was women's suffrage. It is a singular, muscular, fabulous achievement. In August of 1920, it all came down to Tennessee. There were they needed one more state, the 36th state, and it turned out to be Tennessee. Everyone who's a, what we would call a stakeholder in this confrontation descends on Nashville. There are suffragists who are mainstream pragmatists. There are suffragists who are militant radicals. There are anti-suffragists who are extremely well-funded. And speaking of well-funded, there's the liquor lobby, which is fearful that if women get the right to vote, they will never be able to remove prohibition from the books. So all of these, and the, and the liquor lobby, it is said, um, sets up a, they call it the Jack Daniels suite in the Hermitage Hotel, where they are said to dispense both liquor and bribes. It's a ferment. There's controversy all over town. And the Senate, the state Senate, pretty quickly passes suffrage. Carrie Chapman Catt, the leader of the mainstream forces, says, we have 35 and a half states. And all eyes look to the House, where every time they take the vote, it's, it's deadlock. It's 48-48. The Activism is phenomenal. The suffragists give out little yellow roses for their supporters to wear on their jacket lapels. 
the anti-forces give out red roses. And so the floor of the house sort of looks like, <laughs> I imagine, a circus tent. Um, and it's, it's, it's a fight to the end. And finally, uh, one man, Harry T. Byrne, a 24-year-old member of the house, uh, very new to politics, who has been wearing a red rose on his lapel all week, stands up and announces that while he has been against suffrage, because that is what his constituents wanted, he has just received a letter from his mother. We have the letter. And he reads it. And it says from Phoebe, hooray and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. Be a good boy and help Carrie Chapman Cat put the rat in redification. Love, Mama. And so he did. And I mentioned that story to tell you, to remind you that Sometimes it just takes one person. Um, I also want to disrupt a little bit the normal um, telling of the suffrage story, the timetable. Normally people begin in 1848 when Elizabeth Cady Stanton writes the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments for a women's rights conference in Seneca Falls, New York. And they end in 1920, when the 19th Amendment, thanks to Harry Byrne, is ratified and embedded into our Constitution. My story is longer. I begin during the American Revolution, when Abigail Adams writes a letter to her husband. And I end in the 1960s, when African American women who are technically enfranchised by the 19th Amendment and do register to vote all over the country. But African-American women in the Deep South are prevented from registering to vote by Jim Crow laws, um, literacy tests, poll taxes, and even the very real threat of violence should they show up um, at the polls. This is two centuries, eight generations of women, often with progressive men at their side, persisting, getting up every time they are defeated, going toward the goal. Um, and so I want to talk a little about those two poles of my history. During the revolution, there was, as many of you know, there was much talk it was like a revolutionary fervor. There was talk of divorcing the tyrant in Britain. Um, there was talk of liberating ourselves. There was talk of equality. And this sort of conversation by pamphlet influenced many groups of people. It influenced slaves. It influenced uh, Native Americans. It influenced white men who had no property and therefore had no vote. And it, and, it, and it really resonated with women. Women were critical by any measure, any reading of history. They were critical to the success of the economic boycotts against Britain. Um, many of them, you know, stopped importing British tea and made their own herbal brews. Um, there were spinning parties where women um, got together to, to make their own cloth so they didn't have to import from Britain. And some women like Deborah Sampson uh, disguised themselves in men's clothing and signed up to go to war. So the buy-in from women was extraordinary. And Abigail Adams, also feels this. And she writes, as John Adams, her husband, is going off to the Second Continental Congress, she writes him a letter that is so prescient that I want to read it to you today. This is 17, March of 1776. She writes, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies 
Do not put such unlimited power in the hands of the husband. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and we will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. So for me, this is the clarion call that begins American women's struggle to win the vote. She's saying here, we're not gonna obey those laws if we have no part in making those laws. And John Adams is uniquely attuned to what Abigail is saying. Unlike many of the others, he seems to understand that the result of this new republic that they're creating will be to enfranchise people more and more and more over time. He says to her that he's worried. We have been told that our struggle has loosened the bands of government everywhere. Kids were rebelling against their teachers. Native Americans were slighting their guardians, he says. Slaves were rebelling against their owners. But he writes to her and he says, but your letter was the first intimation that another tribe, even more numerous and powerful than all the rest, were grown discontented. This is the tribe of women. And he understands that they will fight for as long as it takes to win their rights. I wanna say that in my view, no group fought harder and longer than African-American women from the very beginning. After the Civil War, the Congress passes several, they're called Reconstruction Amendments that will free, uh, end slavery and enable black men to vote. This is the crowning achievement of the abolitionist movement. These people who have been um, agitating to end slavery and to make citizens of African Americans. And what happens in 1972, um, the first presidential election, I guess it's not the first, is it? But anyway, in 1972, we have anecdotal stories of not just black men showing up at the polls to exercise their new votes, but black women show up in Yazoo City, Mississippi, in Macon, Georgia. These women show up and when asked by missionaries and other um, voter observers why they are there, they say they are there to vote, to keep their men straight. They're there to, and being st keeping straight in, those, in that context means voting against the party of slavery and for the party of Abraham Lincoln, the great liberator. They already see the vote as a community asset and they want to make sure that men are not lured by a bribe or some other motive to vote the other way. Um, some of them even suggest that they have been withholding sexual um, marital favors um, to, to make sure of this. That same year, 1872, is also important because it's when the suffrage movement more broadly adopts a new strategy and it's called the new departure. Women like Victoria Woodhull have looked at these reconstruction amendments and then have concluded that the 15th amendment which is a ban on voting discrimination against citizens, includes them. And so they show up all over the country. They start showing up at, to register to vote. Susan B. Anthony uh, goes to register with several friends in Rochester, New York. She's arrested. There's a very famous trial um, and she gives a very famous fiery speech. You can look this up on Google um, in which she uh, admonishes the judge for um, 
for depriving her of her rights as a citizen. There's another woman named Mary Ann Chad Carey. She's a black journalist in Washington, DC. She's also a law student at Howard. Um, and she leads a huge delegation of 60 women, black and white, with Frederick Douglass, the famed orator, at her side. And they march down and they register to vote. Apparently, they never were allowed to vote, but they did manage to register. So this drumbeat of passion for the vote is just a singular aspect of African-American women that I think we need to reintegrate into the meta-narrative of women's suffrage. Even into the next century, in 1913, a suffrage leader named Alice Paul decides that she wants to have a huge parade in Washington, D.C. She's going to stage it the day before Woodrow Wilson's first inaugural. And uh, she wants to inspire as many women as possible from all over the country and from all walks of life to show up, to show the nation how popular this once very radical cause has become. And so she's privileging size. She wants numbers. And she gets application from the Howard University sorority Delta Sigma Theta. And they want to march in the parade too. And she's very worried because if she lets black women march in the parade, she's afraid she will lose the Southerners uh, that she has on board, and many other people who have um, bigotry in their hearts. And so she's, she's not sure, she's demurring about them. Finally, she reneges. The Delta girls put, uh, the sorority sisters put in their application that they did not want to march in the back of the parade. They wanted to march with other college students. And so she finally reneges, although there are several accounts of this in various histories, I believe that is what happened. And they march in the parade. The other person that we know of who wanted to march in that parade was Ida B. Wells. And I hope you have heard of her. To me, Ida B. Wells is one of the most stellar characters in American history. She was a Memphis journalist who, uh, a friend of hers was lynched uh, because he had the audacity to make a living from his business and this threatened white shop owners in the area. Um, and she was so aggrieved about this that she used all her skills of journalism to do what we would call a massive investigative report um, detailing, she went all over the South detailing um, who was killed, when they were killed, why the allegedly they were killed. Um, and it is documents the horrific nature of lynching. Um, just as she, the paper she co-owns in Memphis is about to print it, she goes off to the North to give a suffrage speech. And the night before the presses were to roll, the building is burned to the ground. Um, she takes the story to a uh, New York uh, black paper I think it's called the New York Age, which publishes it. Later, there's a pamphlet published. Later still, it's the spark that really begins the NAACP. And then she moves to Chicago. And she, like many Black women, after white suffrage leaders start distancing themselves from them, they start their own suffrage organizations. And she starts the Alpha Club in Chicago, and she applies to march in Alice Paul's parade. And the Illinois delegation had refuses to let her join. Um, but Ida B. Wells is not to be denied. She's a very strong woman. She comes to Washington anyway. She stands on the curb waiting for the Illinois delegation to appear. And when it does, she sneaks in between two friends and marches the rest of the length of the parade with them. 
When the 19th Amendment was ratified, many African American women tried to vote, to register, and in, as we said, um, around the nation, many were successful, but in the Deep South, it was very difficult. In 1926, a woman, a school teacher named Indiana Little, led a delegation, it is said, of 1,000, mostly women, a few men, to the Birmingham, Alabama courthouse to try to register. She is asked to take a literacy test, and she argues with the registrar that this is discrimination because white people are not required to take it. She is arrested for vagrancy. She is jailed. She is beaten in jail. She is raped in jail. Um, and it takes another many decades um, before Indiana Little gets the right to vote. I believe um, it is, she's, by then she's 55 years old. And by then, a new generation, a new civil rights movement is stirring. Um, and it's going to take the last steps in assuring that American women, no matter their race, no matter their location, they are citizens, they are voters. Um, in 1962, Fannie Lou Hamer, who was in ill health, with little education, she was a sharecropper. She decided she wanted to vote. She decided that she couldn't change how difficult life was unless she had the right to vote. So she went down to the registrar in Indianola, Mississippi, and she is refused. And she comes back to her home uh, where she lives on a plantation, the plantation owner, W.D. Marlowe comes to her home and says, Fannie Lou, I hear you've been going down to the courthouse and I want you to know we are not ready for that now here in Mississippi. And Fannie Lou Hamer says to him, Mr. Marlowe, I didn't go down there to register to vote for you. I went down there to register to vote for me. Fannie Lou Hamer was, um, kicked off her home, she was fired from her job, she was menaced by drive-by um, assassins, um, she was beaten horrifically in jail um, so much that she uh, was in pain for the rest of her life, but she became a great voice um, for women, for black women particularly, particularly in the South, um, to rise up and claim their place in the Republic. Um, there are many other black women, I could talk about them for a long time, um, but uh, you can read some of them in the book. One of my favorite others is named Vera Pidgey, who was in Clarksdale, Mississippi. She was a beauty salon owner, and she did hair while she did activism. She, she would do people's hair and then talk to them about the need to vote. But also she had a little room in the back of her salon where she taught adults, any black adults who wanted to come, men and women. Um, she taught them how to pass literacy tests. And it was said that she personally um, helped register over a hundred black Mississippians even before the Voting Rights Act was enacted. So these are our real profiles in courage. I wanted to talk a little about um, where social change comes from and how public opinion gets um, shifted. Um, like many movements for social change in our own time, like gay marital equality and medical marijuana. Many of these movements start in the States. They blow like a wind of change, often from the West. And I, whenever people ask me, how do you make social change? I say, start in your neighborhood. Because this is the history of women's suffrage by the States, okay? And, 1890, Wyoming becomes the first state in the nation to 
give women the right to vote. Now they've actually, Wyoming gave women to the vote, the vote 20 years earlier, but now they're entering the union as a state, not staying as a territory. And when they apply to enter the state, uh, to enter the union as a state, Congress says, we'd like you to drop your suffrage application for women. And they say, no, if the women can't vote, we're not coming in. And Congress backs off. So that's 1890. The next one is Colorado, three years later. Colorado is the first state to enact women's suffrage, not by legislative fiat, but by the voters at the polls. And of course, all the voters at the time are men. Um, then we have Utah, Idaho, the state of Washington. In 1911, the state of California enacts a suffrage ballot initiative to enfranchise women. It is an extremely close election. It, it is decided by one vote per precinct, but it has huge national implications because it means that by the presidential election in 1912, 1.2 million American women are eligible to vote for president. And by 1916, when many more states continue this sweep of change across the landscape, um, analysts looking at the election results say that Woodrow Wilson would not have been reelected without the votes of these suffrage states. By 1917, New York passes suffrage, and it is said to be the tipping point for the 19th Amendment because New York has the largest congressional delegation. So here are 43 votes suddenly moving into the suffrage column. And in fact, in 1919, two years later, when Congress considers and finally passes the 19th Amendment and sends it for ratification to the states, there are 27 of 48 states and the territory of Alaska who have already enfranchised women. Why is this important? Because in the 19th century, when women like Susan B. Anthony appealed to Congress for the vote, they came as petitioners. They came, and that's really all they had. And you can go to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. and see these petitions. They're literally on long scrolls of parchment. They come in from all over the country. There are massive amounts of signatures. But that's all they have. They have signatures and they have whatever eloquence Elizabeth Cady Stanton can muster for Susan B. Anthony's speeches. Now you come to the 20th century, the women lobbying Congress for the 19th Amendment now are coming from states where they're already, they're not coming as petitioners, they're already constituents and they have the power to vote you out of office if you don't join their cause. So that is the power of grassroots. That is the power of local. Um, and I think it's something that all of us might remember. I want to talk a little about public opinion and then I want to open it up um, to hear your questions. I'm looking forward to a conversation. Um, in 1920, after the vote, after tennis, you know, after Harry Burns stood up and and Tennessee ratified and the amendment was embedded into the U.S. Constitution. Carrie Chapman Catt looked back on the long campaign and, and I wanna read you what she said, she wrote. She said, to get the word male in effect out of the Constitution cost the women of the country years of campaigning. During that time, they were forced to conduct 56 campaigns of referenda to mail voters, 480 campaigns to urge legislatures to submit suffrage amendments to voters, 47 campaigns to induce state constitutional conventions to include women's suffrage planks, 30 campaigns to urge presidential parties 
conventions to adopt women's suffrage planks in party platforms, and 19 campaigns with 19 successive Congresses. Hundreds of women gave the accumulated possibilities of an entire lifetime. It was a continuous, seemingly endless chain of activity. Young suffragists who helped forge the last links of that chain were not born when it began. Old suffragists who forged the first links were dead when it ended. I don't know about you, but hearing those words a hundred years later, you can almost hear her sigh. But my own view is that what won women's suffrage was all those defeats. When Elizabeth Cady Stanton produced the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments at Seneca Falls, she, as I said earlier, she asked for many things, for property rights, for rights over children, for rights to education. But the most controversial thing she asked for was that women have the right to vote. It was so controversial that her husband, Henry, boycotted the meeting for fear it would hurt his political career. And her co-sponsor, a Quaker named Lucretia Mott, said, Lizzie, they will make us ridiculous. It was toxic. It was a toxic, radical idea. Men ridiculed it. They were afraid that if women became political animals, if they descended into the corrupt, cigar-smoking, um, dark, dingy rooms of politics, it would harden them, emasculate men, and destabilize the family that women would lose interest in their children. Um, they would be just as corrupt and horrible as the male politicians, instead of being sort of these moral figures who influence reform campaigns with their maternalistic, um, it was called municipal housekeeping to clean up the political system much as they had cleaned up their homes. It took a long time because the public needed to be persuaded that, that those fears were not justified. And every time there was a ballot initiative, there was also a debate in the newspapers. Every time there was a parade where women showed up from every possible, you know, occupation and um, status to show their interest. And even the Men's League for Women's Suffrage March it all served to normalize something that had been once radical. And I guess I should end with this idea that social change, there's always a, a social toll, a personal toll for social change. In this case, I love the story of Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who had been voting, of course, for many years. And in 1918, the year after women got the right to vote in New York, he got in his car at Oyster Bay and, um, and was intending to go to the polls. And he found his wife there. And he said to her, Edith, what are you doing here? And she said, why, Theodore, I'm going to vote. Now, Theodore Roosevelt had been, uh, at first he was rather indifferent to the cause of women's suffrage. Um, in the early years, he said, when women, when enough women want to vote, they will have it. Until then, I have many things to do. When he ran as an independent, when he ran on the Bull Moose progressive ticket um, for president, he needed the votes of women. And so he, was the first presidential candidate to embrace the cause. And he was diligent about supporting the cause. But when he saw his wife, when he saw that the impact of the change he had been advocating and fighting for for many years was that his wife was gonna vote, it was such a revolution for his generation that according to a friend, he just sank back into the chair of the car and said nothing. 
that it was an enormous change that women made one convert at a time. And so with that, I would love to take a question. Thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderful. I had, I had no idea how grateful we should all be for Wyoming. Um, <laughs> that was a new tidbit that I appreciated. And so for those of you here in attendance, we would love for you to ask questions. And there are two ways to do so. One, you could submit a question using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Alternatively, you can use the icon options at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand and a hand will appear next to your name under our list of attendees and then Dr. Tucker Wargs will unmute you and let you know that you're free to speak to Dr. Newman directly. Um, so while hopefully some of you are eager to ask a question, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask something while others of you post something. Um, could you speak briefly, Dr. Newman, about the impact of World War I on the movement? Uh, clearly there was some overlap there. Um, and, and then we'll turn to those of you who are asking questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Um, you know, it's hard sometimes when you're involved in a, a social cause, sometimes history happens. And World War I was one of those times when women were pushing for the vote and all of a sudden the nation is thrown into war. It, it sort of divides the, the movement. The, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt was a co-founder of the Women's Peace Party. Um, she's also president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And she has two million members. And she decides that the way to win suffrage is to commit these two million members to war service on the home front, to, to engage themselves as citizens, to show the country that they support the union. And so she is, you know, immediately uh, banned from the Peace Party, but it's a, and she's called the hypocrite, um, but it's, it's the price she pays for the policy that she thinks is going to work. On the other hand, there's, there's Alice Paul, who is leading the radicals of the movement. Um, some of their tactics, we would not find radical. But in fact, Alice Paul is the first woman who thinks, the first person who stages a political rally at the gates of the White House um, in 1917. She sends she calls them her silent sentinels because they do not talk. They just speak through their signage. And their signage usually um, disparages Woodrow Wilson for his war rhetoric, his pitching to the world um, consent for the governed while not affording it to the women citizens at home. And the, she is called, uh, someone lacking patriotism, someone who is pushing her own personal agenda while the nation is going to war and our boys are coming home in boxes of coffins uh, laden with American flags. This is a very harsh time. There is um, passion on both sides. These two women don't like each other. If you, you know, want, I mean, you can read their correspondence at the Schlesinger Library at Harvard. Um, there, there's just reeks with enmity. Um, but in some way, they are both needed for the cause. Um, in some way, the pragmatist, Carrie Chapman Catt, who understands how to get Wilson on board, who understands how to uh, make a bill become law, who knows how to work the halls of Congress. She's making some progress, but so is Alice Paul, who is sending her silent sentinels to the White House. They, after we enter the, after the United States enters the war, the Wilson administration starts arresting them. They send them to Occoquan, which is a horrible, filthy, um, abusive jail. Many of them are beaten 
Um, some of them go on hunger strikes and are force fed. Many people don't know this. American women went to jail for the right to vote. Um, and, but she is angry, Alice Paul and her radicals are angering many people, but in some sense, she's also making sure the issue is always uh, on the table, that it is in the press, it is being debated, perhaps angrily. Um, so I think, in my view, um, you need both to make change, and that's what really happened. During the war, they both sides had to figure out how to win the political war while navigating public opinion about the hot war. And so it, it becomes, a, to me, a very interesting chapter in the longer story. So thank you for that question. Um, and a question from one of our students. Why do you believe that some women did not want the right to vote? Ah, uh, the antis. Um, the anti-women, the anti-suffrage women, they're called the antis, they felt um, that women would have more moral influence uh, by not becoming political figures. That they had influence, you know, sort of subtle influence on their husbands, their brothers, their fathers, um, that they could affect change more subtly um, certainly in the great reform movements of the progressive era, they are, they are very well figured even before the vote. Um, they lead the charge for clean water and clean milk and cleaner government. Um, and I think they felt that they would lose their moral edge uh, if they, if they um, descended into politics. Ironically, the antis, when World War I happened, the antis stopped campaigning against the vote and they put all of their funds toward helping with the war effort. And it was the calculation that lost them ground during the war. And then, of course, right after the war, um, you have some movement toward, um, toward embrace of this idea by the public. Thank you. And, and so I'm going to combine a, a few questions now. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment has, as, is on the forefront of many of our minds, uh, as well as just other battles going on for greater gender equality. Um, what is it that the suffragists did that maybe the ER rights, uh, ER advocates did not do? And along with that, uh, what gives you hope that, that other groups will succeed in, in fighting for their equality? What can we learn from the suffragists? And, and do you have hope for the ERA and hope for other forms of equality overall? Well, I'm a very hopeful person. Um, so I always have hope. And I, it seems to me that if the women suffragists could manage this over two centuries, you know, that we can we can keep pushing for longer on the ERA. I think the ERA was uh, heard at the beginning. I don't, I'm not an expert on the ERA, so I would um, refer you to a new book that's coming out by a colleague of mine. Um, her name is Rebecca DeWolf, um, and I forget the title, but you should be able to find it under that name. Um, there was some, Women were not united um, at the beginning. There were some women who feared that if you adopted an equal rights amendment, it would hurt some of the reforms that women had already enacted to help the poor or to help, you know, things like uh, child labor laws, women's pay laws. Um, there was a feeling that you could hurt the progress already made. And so there was some, even within the movement, within the paradigm of suffrage advocates, there was some division there. And I think that may have lasted longer than, than we think. I, I know now there is a, there's this attempt to reinvigorate it um, 
it has already, there are constitutional amendments, as I mentioned earlier, have a very um, arduous, you know, steep hill to climb. Um, and that includes a time limit. It, yeah, it's usually seven years to get ratification by three fourths of the states. And I know that the ERA has long since um, missed its deadline, but there is an effort to get Congress to extend it. So I think that's where the play will be. Uh, and then it's a question of turning public opinion. As I said in my remarks, um, you know, one thing I didn't talk about is tactics. Women suffragists, when, when there's a woman named Harriet, um, Harriet Stanton Blatch, who was Elizabeth Cady Stanton's youngest daughter. And she lived in Britain for many years. She married a Brit. And when she came back um, to America in the early 1900s, she was shocked to find that the, the movement her mother had started had, had descended into a rut. Um, it was really preaching to the choir. And she wanted to shake it up. She wanted to bring all these tactical inventions that she had seen in the British movement back to America. And so began this wonderful period of political experimentation. Suffragists did everything you could imagine. They, they were flyers dropped from airplanes driven by, by female pilots. Um, there was marching parades, there were soapbox oratory where women would take, you know, a box that you could get, like a crate from a grocery store, put it in the middle of a town at noon, get up on the crate and just start talking. And soon they would gather a circle of people to listen to them. There were um, parades, pageants, um, there were baseball game, suffrage days at baseball stadiums. There was cold calling of men. Um, there were women holding replicas of the Statue of Liberty all over, um, you know, the bays and rivers of America. They tried anything that would get publicity, anything that would get a conversation going about their issue. Um, and so I think what's left for the ERA to do is um, not, to, not to mimic them or follow them um, blindly, but to think about how to win over the unconverted instead of just talking to the converted. And another question we have, uh, John Adams seemed to be receptive to Abigail's letter to him and her warning about women's rights. Uh, do we see any evidence that John Adams' politics changed? Oh my goodness, no. Um, I'm sorry if I left that impression. John Adams, the other thing he said to her in his reply was, don't make me laugh we know better than to repeal our masculine privileges. So he understood um, that they, what she was asking and he was telling her they weren't going to do it. But I read the second part of his response um, because to me it was more interesting. This is where he says, I fear this is coming. I fear all of these groups and of course, you can look at the history of this country as an expansion of the electorate over time. Um, various groups are included in the fellowship of citizenship. So yeah, I'm sorry if I left that impression. What I do think about Adams is that he was more prescient that, than some of the other founders about um, how the country would change and how this issue of all men are created equal would haunt them, would haunt the founders, um, because people would read it literally and seek remedies so that it applied to them. Thank you, great question. <laughs> Uh, and another question just concerning public education and, and the questioner has some concern that maybe at one point in time, some of this will be stripped from, from public education. 
I guess, what, what do you think is so critical to the next generation understanding the suffragist movement? Um, what do we need to hold tightly to, uh, to, to educate future generations when it comes to suffrage? That is a delicious question. Um, I, I had not thought of it, but I, I suppose there is room for fear on that score. I, I was drawn to this topic. You know, I, I think um, Karen mentioned that I had, or Dr. Robinson mentioned that I had a um, history as a journalist before I went back to the university. Um, and, and, and I was rather advanced age at the time. Um, I used to joke that I was the only person that went from American University's student health uh, plan right into Medicare. But um, I, w w I searched for a dissertation topic. I was immediately drawn to this idea of women's suffrage, mostly because I knew nothing about it. It just simply was not taught when I was coming up. And uh, I think your question suggests to me that it could be forgotten again. Um, but if I had, you know, like a magic wand, um, I, would, I would hope um, that it, it could be taught as a template for social change and a reminder of how African-American women had to fight again, had to fight alone, had to fight longer um, to make it right. And I think we'll, uh, we'll address two more questions and, and then we'll try to wrap it up. Um, another question from our attendees, how did suffragists counter the claims that their actions and demands were against the current law? and therefore illegitimate, as well as a threat to social peace and political order? Um, well, I believe they countered it with all of the tactics they used and with, you know, there was a lot, in my first book, Gilded Suffragists, I found a number of relatives on opposing sides of this issue. There were sisters, um, the Meyer sisters who, um, one was for suffrage, one was not. There was a father, the, the owner of the New York Times and his daughter were very close otherwise, had um, spirited debates about this issue. And I really believe that it was converting people one at a time. Um, the, the controversy, the, the toxic nature of the radical, you know, the, the, the reputation of suffrage was that it was a radical idea um, promoted by, you know, fringe intellectuals and lesbians or women who weren't married and were unhappy. I mean, that was the, that was the assumption. And that, you know, sort of a, a subtext in the, in the readings that you can do about it. Um, and how women overcame that was, was just this big tent. I, I really believe that um, you have to combat um, slurs with a linking of arms and a show of strength. And so I'm, I'm gonna combine the, the final two questions <laughs> from our, um, our attendees here, uh, trying to be as creative as possible here. So there's interest in gauging your opinion on the younger generation that uh, on occasion has sh shown less interest in politics and uh, we're curious how you would encourage, how, what our, our hope is to get them more engaged. And then along with that, do you think we will see more social change within the course of our lifetimes? I, I know all of us vary in our ages, um, but you highlight the fact that this was kind of a two, 200 year uh, journey for women's suffrage. 
Uh, is social change happening any quicker today? Yes. <laughs> I, I think like everything else, it is speeded up by social media, by the passion of people of the younger generation who are out in the streets um, trying to make social change. Um, I, I just disagree with the premise. I think social change is coming fast and furious. And it's in some cases because of the activism of younger people. Um, certainly, I think the George Floyd um, protest marches, as distinct from the riots, um, were just a stunning example of people rising up and saying, okay, this isn't gonna happen anymore. And uh, it's not the America we want. Um, and people are doing that on a whole range of issues, including um, climate change and other things that you can probably think of better than I. Um, but from where I stand, and as Karen, as Dr. Robinson suggested, you know, I'm a, a little older. To me, it seems like the social change is coming faster and faster now. Um, we're on this 24 seven cycle. Um, people are engaged. Uh, on both sides, really. And um, so it, it's going to be raucous. I, I think it's not going to be smooth, um, but maybe it never is. Well, hello. I would like to just thank you, Dr. Joanna Newman. I wish we could all applaud, um, but it was <laughs> wonderful to learn a bit about women's suffrage and just take a breath of air um, in the world we live in, like you're saying, 24-hour news. Uh, we um, just like to pause and learn about our history. So thank you for that. Thank you for those of you who've attended. We appreciate your participation, and I just wish you all the best, and I encourage you to all vote. Good night. Thank you.